So yesterday, the public theater did a live theater production of The Apple Family, which is a fictional family who live in Rhinebeck, New York. <clears throat> and I had seen the four shows with Tony Alessino. Um, and I think they started in 2011, which is when I first started seeing a lot of theater with him. And um, uh, they were, anyway, they were about this fictional family in upstate New York. And uh, the playwright decided he wondered how they were doing. <laughs> the plays were interesting in that they were all, they all just took place around dinner. Like family who lived in different places, but all in the same area, but they all lived in different houses. They would get together and they would eat dinner. Um, and so the play was not like with a lot of the regular dramatic tropes where a lot of things were happening. It was just people talking uh, around dinner and it's very physelic in that way. Anyway, he decided to do a play that is now streaming on YouTube for the next two days for free, and I don't know what will happen with it after that. But it was set right now, um, the family reconnecting through a Zoom conference. And he thought he had kind of finished with his family in 2014. So it was kind of interesting that he was just like, how are the Apple, how's the Apple family doing? Um, and it streamed last night when I was doing my last evening talk, so I didn't watch it. But before I went to sleep, there was a, a bunch of conditions that led to me having internet, and I decided to watch it. And I found it touching and nice and interesting and everything. Um, but just a moment ago, I saw an email from my friend who me, from Tony who told me to watch it. And he sent a link to a New York Times article about the making of the piece. And I had music on in my room. I was listening to music, my apocalypse playlist. <laughs> and... Uh, the song that came on was Born to Die uh, by Sadcore specialist, what's her name, Lana Del Rey. Uh, and Born to Die is a song that is referencing a Shakespeare, qui Shakespeare quote. You, know, you and I, we were born to die. We were all of us born to die. Uh, but it was in my apocalypse playlist because it's a nice thing to think about. We're all going to die. We were born to die. It's what we're here for. We're here to go. We're all here to go. Um... So I don't know if it was like the background sad core music, but in reading this article, I started crying. Now, over the last few months, you may have cried, but I, a lot of the times when I cry, it's just like, I feel the sensation ripple through my body and my like eyes well up and I sob a tiny bit, but it's an experience of 20 seconds of action with ripples that last for a couple minutes. It's very rare that I cry slash sob. But while I was reading this article about the play, the, the broader spectrum of the human emotional makeup, I guess people caring about other people, the, the fear, the confusion, the worry, and then again, the goodness, the, the, the care. Um, and other people's emotional realities. I think that's kind of, I, I've talked about that in a couple of my talks that if I go along with someone who has an emotional reality and I can be with them, then I can sympathetically have that kind of experience. So I don't know, I felt that more in reading the article than I did last night um, while watching the play. However, um, it could just be I'm in a different state, but I started crying while reading it. And although I've had many moments over the last couple months of crying, which have been these like 20 second experiences that then settle into ripples. While reading this article, I just kept crying and I was like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> and I turned off the song, Born to Die had not finished. I turned off the song and I just, and I was like eating pineapple. <laughs> it was very like one of those, like I'm eating and crying and reading and music's playing and the waves. And I have hives all over my body right now. So I'm very uncomfortable. And I, I just stopped eating, I stopped reading, I stopped listening, I stopped the music, and I just sat back and I was like, what is going on? Like, what's the emotional reality going on here? And I just tried to connect into it as much as possible and just cried, and cried and cried and cried, and occasionally I'd laugh at myself and cry and cry and cry. Um, and I always think crying is so amazing because I'm not somebody who cries very often. 
Uh, so when those things hit me, and it's really hard to say like what it was that made me cry, um, besides what I already tried to say, like the humanity of just being a part of humanity. I don't know what else to say. The, that's usually what makes me cry is like how much people care about things, how much they try to be happy or passionate or, um, you know, and then they suffer in the process. <laughs> And it seems a very worthwhile thing to suffer over, to, um, to care about people we love, to care about virtues we love, to care about aspects of the world that we, that we love, to care about animals we love, whatever it is, um, to break our heart over <sighs> wanting the world to be a be better place, trying to make the world a better place, or mourning the loss of whatever we think is good, whatever we think is right. Uh, I don't know. So I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do my, my evening talk tonight because somebody asked me to teach a class on the beach. Um, and it's the only time that would work for them. And I, then I have to do a test for the Montauk Chia seminar, which starts on Saturday. And I won't be doing my evening talks next week because I'll be in this Montauk Chia seminar. So, <laughs> after sitting here and crying for a while, I went and washed my pineapple plate and fed some iguanas that, you know, they, they watched me walk out and I was like, can you guys see? I have no idea. Sometimes it's funny to look at animals and you're like, how do you see? How are you perceiving the world that we're sharing? Um, but he just like stood there looking at me. He could tell I had a plate full of pineapple, I think. He smelled it, he liked it. So I cut off little pieces and fed them to him I, you know, from a distance, he threw it it's not, so as not to scare him. And then another iguana came up, and I was like, hi. And I was like throwing them both pieces of pineapple. Um, and that felt really nice after crying, the sympathetic, like, can I just give you, I was going to throw this away, but if you like it, I'd love, you know. And they don't have teeth, so it's really hard for them to eat things. <laughs> just throw it in their mouth. <laughs> um, and it's kind of funny, again, I don't think they see very well because like I threw a piece of pineapple in front of one of them and he could smell it, I guess. But he tried to eat the ground in front of it <laughs> before he stepped forward and grabbed it with his mouth. Uh, I find lizards incredibly endearing myself. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Though I did reflect on um, hugs, my darling. Yeah, my mom uh, loves chickens, and one of my first pets, I actually had a lot of pets, but one of my very important pets was a rooster. And like all boys, or like most boys, I loved dinosaurs. And it's very, I just had a reflection while I was hanging out with these iguanas that um, birds are the only uh, survivors from the apocalypse that killed all the dinosaurs. And so... I've always loved lizards and iguanas and snakes and so on and so forth, but I think it's funny that like I had such a relationship with chickens when I was younger, and I didn't know they were dinosaurs, but now I do. I had pet dinosaurs when I was a kid. So I don't know, I mean, I don't know how, I'm glad that my mother chimed in and said she thinks crying is therapeutic. I think it's therapeutic too. I don't know if mom, you're still watching, if you think that crying is something that you have some kind of control over, I mean not control over, but relationship where you can work with it. One of the stories that I often tell people is, uh, I don't know if any of you can chime in if you feel like you have control over crying or more, more what I mean not to stop your crying, but to make yourself cry. And I will tell this story if you want to chime in. Um, I, my first apartment I ever paid rent on in New York City was on the Lower East Side in 2005, and I was sharing the apartment with a girl who I had met at the massage school, Kami and I lived out in Northern California. And uh, she meditated every morning. And part of her meditation was reflecting on anything in the world that was tragic, anything that was unjust. And I mean, really, if you just take a second, there's countless things you can think of, like, deforestation of habitat and the extinction of animals and child sex trafficking or yeah you know, these corrupt politicians totally destroying the world we live in because they can't help themselves there's a lot of things you can cry over um 
we could go on and on and on. And she would just pick something every morning and she would connect into it and she would cry and cry and cry. And I didn't know this. So like one day I walked out and I was like, is there anything I can do to help you? I hear you cry every morning and it just makes me feel like breaks my heart that you're so unhappy in your relationship. And she was like, honey, I'm not crying over my relationship. It's, you know, it's she, and she explained this as her meditation. Um, and I've never been able to do that. Which, you know, I don't have, and one of the, th one of the um, mark of a lot of good actors, actresses, actors, is their ability to cry on cue, um, to access the sorrow inside of themselves and just bring it up and bring it out. I mean, I mean, it's funny to think of like an action star, although he's not just an action star, like Bruce Willis. Um, I remember reading an interview with Terry Gilliam where he said, oh, I hired him for 12 Monkeys because I was watching Die Hard and there was a scene where he cried and it, he did it so well that I was like, oh, this guy could be, you know, he's a multi-dimensional person. He's not just this action hero. Um, but that's not something I'm, I've ever been able to do to access, I don't know, sorrow or tragedy or something in such a way that I can uh, just bring it up. Yeah, it's organic. It just happens. That's human. That's human. It's human that you just, that you cry and it just happens. Um, be, it's one of those things that because I don't have power over it. Uh, one of my first perceptions of crying when I was younger was that you did it to manipulate people. I saw my father, what I perceived, he cried in front of us once to emotionally manipulate us to get us on his side. He was kind of, this is my perception. Um, and, uh, but it left a huge impression on me. I was like seven, I think, and was just like, crying is just something people do to manipulate other people into, you know, doing what they want, emotional blackmail or something. Um, so I kind of didn't trust crying a lot growing up, even in myself. I, I mean, I guess I, I was also being toxic, toxically raised by toxic masculinity of the idea that it's weak to cry or wrong to cry. Um, but when I, in the times in my life, hi there, Michael. In the times in my life when I have been hit by a wave of, of whatever it is that completely takes over my body and usually takes over the consciousness although there's almost always a part of me that will just like be will like step out to the side and be like what the fuck is going on you know you're, you're snot pouring out of your nose and the, all the water coming out of your eyes and the sounds the sounds of crying but as my mother said, it's therapeutic. It's an amazing sensation after you're done crying, just this, like, whatever it releases in the body. Yeah. Yeah, so James chimed in, and he was talking about that release. And it's, um, again, I do think it's an amazing ability to be able to connect into the part of you, the crying mechanism, the emotional crying mechanism. Um, so how many of you have been um, crying a lot, would you say, over the last two months? Uh, one, one of my friends, uh, he said he's been, cry one of my, who signed on earlier, uh, he said he's been crying, you know, little sobs throughout the days, you know, almost every day. I don't know, not every day, but he said, you know, pretty regularly. Um, and then occasionally has like a full, full on cry. So today was my first full on cry, but I have, I would say, you know, had a lot of, especially in the first month of like, you know, mid-March to, oh, you cried today reading. My friend Tom is reading uh, a compendi a couple different compendiums of my writing projects over the years. And I imagine there's a lot worth crying about in there, if I remember correctly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say definitely in the first like, mid-March to mid-April, I had a lot of moments of crying that it was funny because I was grappling with the idea of being free of the fear of death. James, you think you cry mostly over being lonely or you think the complexity of whatever it is that brings you to crying is on the foundation of your loneliness? Um...
that's the thing. Over the, the, the month that I found myself crying a lot, I, I noticed that I was working with this idea of being free of the fear of dying because I was like, so much of what's happening right now is this insane fear of dying. Um, like not wanting anyone to die, which is nice and everything, but it's just impossible and crazy. Uh, and uh, so I was trying to just relate to that fear of dying a lot. And there's a very different thing from not being afraid of dying and not mourning the death of someone. And even saying like, oh, it's totally insane to be afraid of dying. You knew that coming into this story, you were gonna die. A lot of kids don't understand death until quite a bit later, if they ever do. Um, but I think it's pretty amazing that even in trying to relate to um, being at peace with the eventuality and truth and reality of dying, um, that it still made me mourn, that I still felt this huge hit of mourning in the death. And that was part of what made me cry in the article I was reading today. Um, they talked about an, an actor who died. Um, one of the characters in this play is a theater person and he talks about one of his friends who died. Uh, and I don't know who the actor was. I mean, I didn't click the link, I, did, I might recognize him by face, but uh, of course, a lot of the people in the theater world in, in New York would know who that person is. And uh, um, it's hard to relate to what's sad about someone dying, uh, what, it is that, what it is that makes us cry. I mean, beyond, there's like this dull sadness. We all, we've all had people in our lives die. So there's like a dull sadness where you're just like, oh, I can't text them. I can't ask them about that thing. I can't. Uh, They'll never make me that cookie again, or whatever your relationship was with them. There's that, but then there's this thing, the thing that makes you cry about someone dying. Like, what is that? This, this idea that their story is done, or that... Uh, it's just a mystery to me. I mean, I, I don't know. I've, I was talking with my yoga, my Qigong buddies this morning about emotional intelligence and how that's something that was not... Uh, valued a lot for a lot of us growing up you know they valued physical intelligence prowess the ability to hit balls and run fast and stuff like that and they uh, value intelligence intelligence brainy intelligence like being good at math and poetry perhaps um in but i'd say poetry requires a type of emotional intelligence but they never taught it like that you know it's something that even in religion where they're trying to teach some kind of ethics and spiritual structure it's very rare that they teach like articulate, direct emotional intelligence, which I, I think is probably a very tricky thing to do. It's not something a lot of us were raised with. Love Eugene. The suffering of others. So when you say you're crying has a lot to do with the suffering of others, so that could be like that might relate to what I was feeling, is like crying over somebody else mourning about the death of a friend. Crying about understanding there are people scared and confused. That's happened to me a lot over the last couple months. Just like, as opposed to my own experience of fear and confusion and anxiety, I cry about when I encounter other people's suffering being like they can't help it they're lost in this fear and suffering and that's very it, it's, I don't know if it's sad I don't know if crying's always sad it's this it's obviously not always sad but it's this thing that like the heart touches and it just makes me well up with tears and in fact I think I've only cried once in these videos that I've recorded and I was talking about my first experience with the coronavirus and relating to Wuhan and this kind of like shamanistic journey I did and going there and feeling the suffering of the people there uh, made me cry and going, and then even relating it made me cry. Um, and I remember after that journey, we went into a, uh, like connected with the tragedy of what was going on in Australia at the time, the fires and all the animals dying and all the trees dying and just the earth being angry and burning. And like that made me cry, but it was also like, just exhausting. There's, I guess crying a lot of times is exhausting.
but James, have you been crying frequently? I mean, you, you've said many times you, you're not crying enough. Do you feel like you've been crying more frequently over the last couple months than you would in normal times? Crying over that kind of suffering. Gene, do you think it's sympathetically how you would feel if you were in that situation or just crying for them not being able to have that kind of intimacy and opportunity to mourn and care? Not enough. Again, I've related this story that I, I've only had one point in my life where I cried every day and it lasted for a couple of months. Um, and it was exhausting and exhilarating. Once when my friend died. When my friend died. So you had a friend die, James. And this, um, time. I, I was very concerned the first few weeks of this ordeal. Um, who would be my first friend to die? You know, first you're always the hardest, right? Ah, so, so again, there was a sympathetic mourning with other people mourning about your friend who died. It wasn't just you being sad about, it wasn't just you mourning about your friend who has died, but seeing all the other people mourning about your friend who had died. But yeah, I, uh, a couple of people I know in New York tested positive for coronavirus, but they've all survived so far. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so the people I know who have been, who have tested positive for coronavirus, none of them have died. And uh, it's very, it's very relieving to be like, okay, well, none of my friends have died in this pandemic. None of the people I know personally who have tested positive haven't died. So that's who, you know, and the other people that I know of who have died, like that's sad, but it's not the same kind of feeling. But there is still kind of a horror, like what if a friend does die of this? But that's, I don't know, that, that's not as terrifying to me anymore. I think I'm emotionally over that at this point. I'll feel different if somebody in my life actually does die of it, but um, that is one of those things about emotions. We can always say like, I'm not afraid of death. I'm not worried about this. But when the actuality of it happens, it's a very different experience. It's true, and and Jean, I've never been with a friend who has died right in front of me. I've been with friends shortly after they died. I guess that only happened once, really. Um, but uh, I've heard from people that it's a very different experience to physically be with someone you love when they die, that you, you feel this, there's some amazing, ineffable ex uh, emotional experience to be with someone you love when they die. Um, that doesn't relate to any other experience. Not to say it's a good one, it's partly good, but it's, you know, not, not to say it's a pleasurable one. Um, but that is true that people who, we all die alone, as it were, even if you are surrounded by family, the death experience is something you're having that nobody else can truly relate to. Although, if any of you have ever seen the play um, Exit the King, I feel like they do a great job of trying to explain what dying is like in that play. It's pretty amazing. Um, I saw it with Jeffrey Rush and Susan Sarandon and Lauren Ambrose and it was just like, wow. Uh, uh. See, again, you know, Jimmy, you're talking about this big, complicated, uh, or not complicated, complex emotional I often use the word emotional architecture or emotional landscape. Um, 
emotional matrix. I don't know what you would call that, but there's this huge makeup of people, um, of emotions, you know, that trigger other things and trigger other things. And Tom, do you feel like you eventually did cry about those people who died? You said you never cried during those experiences. You didn't cry while they were dying, when they died. Um, when I had a couple friends die a couple years ago, six years ago, <laughs> five years ago, um, I cried for one of them in the dying process three or four years before he actually died. Uh, I cried a lot. Uh, complex story, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't cry when either of them died. Like when they died, it was more like relief. Like, oh, thank God you're done with that cancer, dying, withering away, stuck in the hospital on lots of medication story. Look good for you, I love you, you're free. It was, a re it was really like a nice relief. But the following months where I couldn't call them anymore and I would constantly be reminded of their lack or their loss or my loss of them, um, that was really intense. And then there was a, I guess it was like eight months later, there was a trigger that, um, that kind of was connected with a heartbreak. That's what allowed me to cry for three months. And I know that it was about the breakup, but it was also about the death of these friends. And then it was also about a whole bunch of other things in life. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate about crying is that it allows this emotional complexity to blossom. Um, and stuff that you didn't even know you needed to mourn over the element related to emotions in astrology and alchemy is water. And it's so nice that like you're crying and the water's just moving through you. And like a storm, there's nothing you can do to stop it. You just have to weather it. Yeah, so Gene, you're bringing up that. You know, one of my friends who's 74 in New York, he's, he's mentioned a couple times, and a couple of my other friends who are in their 70s have mentioned that um, going through what we're going through right now brings up those those AIDS years in like a um, PTSD kind of way that there's all this stuff that you're like wow I can't believe we have to go through this twice in our life but you were able to be at their bedside and right now that's not the option about a month later Yeah. Yeah, but again, I mean, Tom, when you would have those things where you had no idea what exactly triggered it, but you found yourself crying for hours, um, did you notice that you just felt so much better afterwards? If you can even say that, I don't know. I, there's sometimes you don't even notice the feeling better aspect of it. Sometimes you do, but when it's like, when it's too much, you don't even notice the feeling better aspect of it. You're just been like totally exhausted. Yeah. So Jimmy, you're saying connecting with the fact that a friend died and then being able to connect with the nostalgia of the intimacy you once had with him, which at this point was probably over anyway, that's what it sounded like you were very tight 20 years ago, um, that it intensified all of that memory of togetherness and intimacy that just brought up the uh, loneliness. You didn't notice you felt better. You just felt exhausted. Yeah, that's very often what I felt as well. Okay, much love. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, I didn't know how long I wanted to talk with this. Um, I thought it was funny. It's like the heat of the day, although the shade is just starting to reach here. Um, so I was like, oh, I'll just do this talk in my room. And I was like, maybe that's an appropriate place to talk about crying instead of with the beautiful like nature background of the waves. I guess everything's appropriate when talking about crying. It's a very natural thing. But it was just, again, it's kind of a rare experience for me. So it's kind of like, look, I just saw a comet. I just, I don't know, I saw an eclipse. I just cried for 20 minutes or whatever it was. <laughs> and then fed some pineapple to some iguanas. Um, so I'm going to make a post after this.
about that play. If anyone has time, it's only an hour long. Um, and again, the play is, I guess, a fifth part in a, in a story that, or it, it's a trope where it's just a family talking. So a lot of you at this, not all of you maybe, but a lot of you at this point have probably had group um, video calls. You're welcome, Jimmy, love you. Um, group video calls with family and friends at this point. Oh, hello, Chakra, how do you do? There's a little dog walking into my room. Its name is Chakra. It's a fat little chihuahua thing. Wiggle, wiggle. Um, and so it's interesting that that's all the play is. The play is just... <laughs> Chakra. The, ch the play is just a family uh, talking. And so it has moments of nothing important. It just does a pretty good job of that. Nothing important. Um, and then just like telling stories and kind of trying to distract from what's happening and, and then talk about what's happening. It's called What Do We Need to Talk About? So I'll post a link to it and I'll post a link to the article uh, in the New York Times. And uh, you've only got two days to watch it or three days to watch it, I guess, after this. So uh, I hope you enjoy and I'm grateful that, oh, Sean, I'm talking about a play that uh, was just put together in the, in the context of a Zoom call with a family I'm going to post out about it after this, so I don't know if you've heard about that, but it's a nice, interesting innovation with theater that is, you know, using what it's got to work with. Um, nice thing to watch. And I guess this is my talk for today, because I won't be talking this afternoon. Uh, exhausting. Yeah, it's called The Apple. It's The Apple Family by Richard Nelson's Sean. I don't know if you've heard of them, but Sean writes plays, that's why. It's just saying, you know. You've been doing a lot of Zoom theater. Oh, maybe you could uh, post some links then. Or I bet maybe you already have. I'll go look on your timeline. A lot of Zoom theater. I haven't been on Zoom once in the last two months. <laughs> I used Zoom last year once. And I took a class in Zoom a few years ago. But it's nice in this whole time of Zoom, I haven't used Zoom once, but I will this evening. Tonight will be my first Zoom session um, this year. Ugh. Interesting. It's all live but not recorded, okay. Yeah, the Apple family thing was recorded and it's being shown for the next three days and then I guess they'll archive it. Um, I guess they only did one live performance of it. That's cool, I'm glad there's a lot of live Zoom theater going on. I haven't been doing a lot of uh, entertaining myself. I've been reading, I guess. But even like watching movies and TV shows, I haven't been doing a lot of that. There's a lot of noise here. The waves take up a lot of space in my head, which is good. Don't listen to music very much, don't watch TV, don't watch movies very much, but a little bit. <laughs> yeah, right, Sean? Remembering, remember being in physical presence of people and all the different ways we can do it? Sitting across a table and talking, laying naked in bed and talking and cuddling and more passionate things, right? Someday, that'll happen again. I mean, it still happens all over the place. I think it's amazing when I talk to people who are just keeping up that part of their life, and I'm like, oh, so you're not worried, are you? Good for you. <laughs> it doesn't happen to me. Um, that's good. All right, enough for now. Uh, love to you, and uh, hi, Tasha. It's nice, I always like to end these. Oh, I'll end this like this, watch. That's the shutters in my room. Because the shade has come, I can open them. And you can see the sea. just sit here for a minute. And appreciate the beauty in silence.